Welcome to University of Greenwich webinars. My name is Ghislaine Boddington and I'm a reader in digital immersion at the School of Design at the University of Greenwich and your moderator for this webinar. I've been working with the speakers to prepare this evening's debate for the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Greenwich. Today we introduce to you our new visiting scholars and in a moment I will hand over to our Vice-Chancellor and our Pro-Vice-Chancellor to welcome them. Just prior to this, a few structural and practical points. This webinar will run for one and a half hours and our speakers will talk for six or seven minutes each, followed by a discussion and question and answers. The interaction options for you as an audience will be linked to two things. One, you have the chat box at the side where we will place information and links about the speakers and where you can also add your thoughts, your comments and other links that may be relevant for all of us. And then you will see at the bottom there is a question and answers box too. And that's where we ask you to put your questions for the final part of the webinar and to upvote the questions that you would like to be answered most. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the University of Greenwich Research Space YouTube channel after the event. And please do join us in tweeting and sharing this knowledge exchange beyond us that are just here today. So, first of all, I would very much like to introduce the Vice Chancellor of the University of Greenwich, Jane Harrington. Thanks, Jelaine. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for inviting me to say a few words at the web at this, what I think is actually a really exciting webinar. And what I want to first of all say is a massive welcome to everyone and a welcome from both the university and also from the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And really, I'd like to welcome the external members of the academic and artistic community, because you really are joining the ranks of our visiting fellows and professors. And what's so exciting is that we've got so many people that now that bring this wealth of experience, of insights, and actually are really helping us to develop our ideas. So thank you to all of you. Now, I know that some of you are listening from home and that last year we really focused on strategy 2030, and this is our time. And we talked about our ambition for education without boundaries. So what's fantastic is that tonight's panel are really going to live and breathe that for us. So they're going to be talking to us on topic of no longer marginal. So voices that are heard and issues that are highlighted by expert actions from the edges. And I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do that for us. So thank you, everyone. And I do know that the debate will concentrate on a variety of themes and they've been expressed in the strategy because they're really important to the university community. And just some of the themes that I believe that we're going to be hearing today are around inclusivity, diversity, sustainability, collaboration, co-creation, and I'm sure there's many others. So what I think is we're going to be inspired tonight, and it reminds us of the important work that we're doing at the university, but actually how important it is that we now turn it into action and that we really make a difference. So thank you for inviting me. I hope everyone enjoys tonight's event. I think it'll be fantastic. I can't wait to hear from everyone. And I'd now like to pass over to Professor Marco Thomas, who's going to, um, to say a few words. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, and I'd like to extend uh, my warm welcome uh, as well uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, as Ghislaine mentioned previously, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty. Uh, and it's an amazing place to work, uh, University of Greenwich, and we have an amazing faculty. And it's been absolutely wonderful this year that we've extended our family to, to include some new visiting professors. Uh, and uh, this is hence, in a way, the event we're doing this evening. Before we sort of move on, though, I, there's a couple of things I, I'd like to, to say. And first of all, I, I don't think we could really move any further without offering our huge thanks to Ghislaine Boddington for all the outstanding work she's done on creating the conversations we're gonna be having this evening. Uh, Ghislaine's put an awful lot of work into this and she's been absolutely fantastic. I'd also like to say huge thanks to Anastasios Marianis, whose idea it was to uh, find this new way in which we can work together with our visiting professors and fellows. 
to Karen Ward, Araza and Suzanne Luan from our faculty research and enterprise team who have worked tirelessly in the background setting everything up. Now, the topic for this evening is called No Longer Marginal and it addresses the outstanding work that our visiting scholars have undertaken in this area. Uh, and, and it's an area that has really been hugely neglected and then it is only really recently coming to the fore in both the arts communities and of course wider society and asking this question of what does it mean to be marginal or other or voiceless or landless or disenfranchised is something which has really occupied all of our visiting scholars in different ways and it's going to be fascinating to hear uh, what their insights in those issues. And it's one that staff and our faculty are deeply committed to too, whether it be the work undertaken in the, the field of human rights in our, uh, among our lawyers and criminologists, Olga Martin Ortega, for example, and Stacey Banwell, the research exploring the underbelly of London's theatrical economy, as evinced by the forthcoming special issue of uh, comparative drama, which is co-edited by my colleagues Harry Derbyshire and Nick Holden, or the ongoing practice-based research that takes place in the School of Design around inclusive design practices uh, led by Anastasios Maragianis and, and other colleagues in the school. Now here in the UK, as we, we begin to unpick, unearth and excavate the true meaning of, of so-called levelling up, which for many in, in London feels a bit like an inevitable kind of levelling down, the questions that only our artists and filmmakers and dramaturgs and writers can answer in this is becoming more urgent than ever. So I'm so excited to hear what, what our new visiting scholars are, are going to say this evening. As I think we've said previously, we'd really want to make this event not a one off, but an annual event so that we, we can really engage with our visiting scholars communities in, in more constructive and dialogic ways in the future. But for now, I don't want to hold up things any further. So I'm going to hand back to Ghislaine. Thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening and to give you a little bit of context before I invite our, fir our first speaker to join me and to speak about their work. So we have with us Ola, 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 Annie Mashuam, who is going to be our visiting, who is our visiting professor in dramaturge. We have Heather White, who is our visiting fellow of human and labor rights. We have Roy Williams, OBE, who is our visiting professor of playwriting, and Professor Gillian Youngs, who is our visiting professor of design and digital strategy. So welcome to you all and thank you very much for working with me to prepare this. Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of context of what we've, what, how we've set it up between us, because we've been talking very much, we're all aware of the major shifts around the world, but, um, obviously linked to the pandemic, but also to many other cultural, political, environmental, economic upheavals. And we have reached a point of time now in 2022 when all of us really are rethinking and questioning many aspects of 21st century life, society and our ways of being. And I know that you, our scholars, have actually for many years, across many years, have with your passionate advocacy, dedicated your work to a range of very important issues that have in fact risen right to the surface in this present scenario. This work has pioneered a range of processes and outputs that have led to significant shifts. And as Jane mentioned, in the discourses around inclusivity and diversity, sustainability, intersectionality, digital innovation, human rights, co-creation and collaboration, public engagement and meaningful participation. And this is just a touch on a few of the things that you are all working on. And this evening is a chance now for all of us in the audience to listen, to engage and to ask questions and to learn actually how active outputs can enable a more inclusive debate and advance public understanding and policy decisions, enabling a much more progressive society ahead of us. So we've worked together, us four and five, to, to, to enable a sharing which is more personal and about your dedication and your direction. And I've asked you to talk us through how you have kept moving forward through highs and lows across your really issue-led careers and your process, your determination and the 
the influences that have come to you. And I've also asked you all to point to the future a bit for us to see how you feel your topic of concern is moving forward across the next few years, across the next 10 years, and what you see and what you aim to action next. So just to allow our audience to know, the, the Visiting Scholars short biographies and links to their more extensive biographies will be put in the chat at the start of their presentations. And we're sorry that the interaction mode is limited here, but please, as requested, do use the question and answers box where we will ask you now, we ask you now to put in questions as concisely as possible, please, and to upvote questions that you would like to be answered by us in the latter part of this webinar. Just a little thing to say as moderator, I may merge a few questions as needed in the interest of time. So may I ask Ola to join me first um, and ask everybody else to disappear for a moment while we receive Ola's input. So Ola, you're a dramaturg and an associate at the Royal National Theatre and you've spent decades working on new writing developments with the UK's diverse population. And I know that you focus on new ways of seeing and telling and bearing witness to our experience. So I give the floor to you to give us some input and I'll join you again soon. Thank you, Ghislaine. And uh, good evening, everyone. For anyone who needs it, I am a, a black man, a middle-aged black man uh, with brown skin, and I'm wearing black rimmed glasses. And I've got black curly hair and a little afro, and it's going a little grey as well, to be truthful about that. My name is Ola Anamashwan, as has been stated, and I am a dramaturg. And from my point of view, that is someone who is positively invited to interfere interact and intuit with the writer's vision for the ultimate benefit of the writer, a critical friend, as it were, who walks alongside the writer as they journey to the heart of their creativity and back again. Like many, I started out as an actor and like many, I quickly discovered that I was a much better interferer, developer and inspirer of people who wanted to create with words than I was a deliverer of those words. Up until recently, my work has always been underpinned by a desire to expose or call out, as we, as we say these days, uh, in a desperate bid to redress the balance in an acutely unjust and unequal world. I can't stand elitism. I never have been able to. I simply can't remember a time when it wasn't a thing for me. I'm bemused by the notion that some people genuinely believe uh, they are better than some other people and are therefore entitled to more than their fair share. I'm guessing this is coming from my life experience, especially my experience of growing up, which is fairly obvious, really. Uh, where else would it come from? So I operate uh, on the behalf, or at least I used to operate on the behalf, on the belief that if you can expose it, explain it, then we'll all become enlightened and we'll change it. But I was wrong. None of this, what we call society, the world and all its injustices are a mistake. It's quite deliberate. It's meant to be this way. It's been delicately crafted and honed to deliver the exact results and experiences that we perceived as this material world. The system isn't broken. In fact, on the contrary, I'd say until the pandemic, the system couldn't have been in any better health. So that was then. Now, I'm driven to inspire artists to paint a vision of possibility, an alternative reality. None of the way we live and treat each other is inevitable or permanent. We can change and things can be different, uh, which is why I'm currently dedicating a sizable proportion of my mental energy to crafting a new dramaturgy, it's early days yet, and it may go the way of many an idea that looks good on paper or sounds impressive on a webinar or not. However, I need to make space to deliver a series of grade A sessions, introducing and exploring my ideas on what I'm calling a new narrative, based on the belief that our current dominant narratives support and sustain the status quo, rather than as I previously and misguidedly believed, challenging it. Therefore, if we are to dismantle the patriarchy and undermine capitalism, 
which I think we should, because I think we would all benefit from that if we did, then we need to start telling ourselves new stories about co-collaboration, equity, empathy, joy, happy endings, achievement without human sacrifice, collective action and responsibility, and stories that acknowledge that everything is connected, that you can't simply single-mindedly feed your own needs and indiscriminately consume at a voracious rate without taking us all down one almighty sinkhole. So that's the challenge. That's the exploration. That's where I want to go next. And I invite people to come with me, to come and join me. There might be people who are already on that journey and are already working in that way, where we're going beyond the single narrative or the hero's journey or the single protagonist. But as I say, we're working in a much more co-collaborative, co-creative way and telling stories which aren't simply about the ego-driven hero who can overcome all obstacles for the, for the greater good, or at least for their good. As I say, it's a challenge, and I'd be delighted to hear from people if such narratives already exist or such people are already working in that way. Um, so we are in the sinkhole, and this is where things get interesting. The pandemic is, of course, an opportunity, as many have said, the chance to reflect, reconsider and reset. And I'd like to take this opportunity to inspire a new generation of writers to write the stories of the evolution, to imagine the future and tell the stories that will enact it into being. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. That was amazing input and very good to hear about your clear focus on enabling this non-dominant and often invisible voices of our society to be heard um, and through new dram dramaturgical methods which I know we'll all be very very interested in learning more about as you join us more at the university so thank you Ola and now I'd like to ask Heather White to join me um, and Heather is a visiting fellow at, at University of Greenwich of Human and Labour Rights. So Heather, can I ask you to join me uh, by turning on? Yes, hello Heather, great to see you. Now Heather's joining us from New York today, so, um, and told us she was just skiing this morning, so in a very different space to us. But Heather, we know you're going to bring us amazing new insights into sustainability through your time with Greenwich because you've been looking at the global supply, supply chain and at the complicity of big corporations in exploiting workers. And you've created an award-winning documentary and become a filmmaker and a social entrepreneur on your journey towards this. So Heather, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Jelaine. It's very nice to be here. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey um, and the inspirations and influences that uh, inspired me along the way. Um, my career for the last 25 years has had a lot of activism involved, although that wasn't originally my training. Uh, it all started basically when I was getting my master's degree at MIT and the commencement speaker said, you've been given a set of keys, now go and open some doors. And I thought about that um, call to action uh, for several months. And during that time when I was really considering what my next move was going to be, I'd been working in China off and on for the previous 10 years and had uh, worked with factories arranging production there in the very early days uh, when China was just starting to get on its trajectory of economic growth. Um, but while I was imagining where I was going to go, what my next steps were going to be, one day I heard a news report that a, a young man had been killed in Pakistan who'd been a child labor activist. And you can uh, show the slide um, now about Iqbal. Uh, this young man, Iqbal Masi, um, who had actually been a child laborer himself for many years, had been rescued and had become a, a passionate global activist for change in the carpet industry and received the Reebok Human Rights Award. And after he'd been um, 
sent back to Pakistan uh, subsequent to receiving the award, he was killed while riding his bicycle. And I was so struck by what had happened um, that I asked myself, what kind of a world do I want to live in? What kind of a world do I want my children to grow up in? And the response ultimately that I came to as a result of an internal call to action um, a couple months later was that I decided to create a nonprofit organization called Verite. We can show that slide, um, which is still continuing today. I started it in 1995 and I decided to create it as a not-for-profit because we were going to be linking with NGOs and civil society groups worldwide. We ended up working in 60 countries a year while I was there um, to inspect factories, to look at labor conditions and human rights standards, report to companies, report to trade unions and anybody who wanted to find out specifically what was happening in factories where they were buying products from or were considering to buy products from. Um, so linking with organizations around the world, working with Verite ultimately led me on a new trajectory, which was that I wanted to become more grassroots and more activist and work more closely with campaigns on the ground. Um, you can show the New York Times uh, slide now. Uh, because I was becoming increasingly alarmed by the actions that companies are taking, basically to get control of the world, to get control of the planet, to get control of our lives. And this is a recent headline, which inspired me to work on my current project, which you'll see a video clip in a moment, um, which is that we actually have corporations that will brazenly decide that they are willing to uh, take a position that they are going to work against legislation to end modern slavery and human trafficking. In the case of this particular um, story, this is what's happening right now, actually, which is that the Uyghur people in Xinjiang province in China are struggling for their very survival. And they are working in factories all around China for over 83 global brands, as has been reported um, by several researchers. And when I saw that Nike and Coca-Cola are actually trying to work against helping the Uyghur ethnic minority, who are originally from Turkey, and they call their country East Turkestan, actually, before uh, China took over, um, I decided that I was going to have to work on this issue as well. And uh, so we can take a look at um, a short uh, one and a half minutes of my current film project, which is the result of an investigation. I joined the team as a media producer uh, last spring. And there was uh, recently the findings reported in the um, global media. In the spring of 2021, with COVID-19 still a problem, I joined a team to gather evidence of China's abduction of Uyghur refugees who had escaped to Central Asia. Thousands have been forcibly returned to China. We interviewed dozens of witnesses and began gathering evidence. This is my diary from the three-month investigation. My people, the Uyghurs, are an ancient people of Eurasia with a history that goes back to the sixth century. Our home is now occupied. Today, most of those born in East Turkestan are forced to leave and pursue their dreams far from our native land if they wish to survive. These days, Uyghurs are found on every continent on earth, but it's not by choice. As a human rights activist, I live in fear wherever I am. China is always one border crossing away. I fear for my family, and sometimes I think, stop talking, don't share information. But each time my conscience makes me continue. Informers are everywhere. 
People are constantly being watched. People spy on friends and neighbors out of fear. Okay, thank you. Heather, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think what's fascinating actually, um, for I'm sure for all of us, is um, seeing someone like you coming um, with your, your massive corporate and business knowledge, actually moving, moving through into this environmental and human rights activism and creating transformation, but now also bringing that into academia and into the university side with the, with the um, activism too. And we very much look forward to getting more input from that triangulation that you're creating. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. Thank so you. now I'd like to ask Roy to join me, please. Roy Williams. Um, Roy Williams, OBE. Welcome, visiting professor of playwriting for um, University of Greenwich. And Roy, you're an award-winning playwright who also writes for radio and television. And as we know, you are one of the UK's leading dramatists um, and you continue to really push the boundaries in your playwriting forms. Um, and congratulations, because I know that you are also Royal Society of Literature Fellow. But I think many people here may well, or hopefully have seen one of your plays or at least heard about it. So Roy, please do share with us a bit more about your process. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, hello again, my name is Roy Williams and I've been a playwright and a screenwriter for oh, over 25 years. When I was less than two years old, living in Birmingham, my parents had finally decided to end their marriage. My father, who I was named after, went to live in America, and I never saw or heard from him again until almost 40 years later. I did not know at the time, but my father leaving and the rest of my family returning to London helped to define me, to become the writer that I am, to be one of the reasons why I'm with you all right now. One of my earliest childhood memories was being carried upstairs by my eldest sister, to our new home on the council estate in West London. 23 Dombey House, Henry Dickens Court, St Anne's Road, London West 11, 4DW. My mother was an avid book reader. She devoured novels. Mum, who or what is a Dombey? In fact, who is Henry Dickens? And why is the entire estate named after him? Was he a big deal back in the day or something? Does this Henry Dickens have anything to do with the man who wrote Oliver Twist? Because his name is Dickens as well. Is Charles Dickens related to Henry Dickens' mum? Henry was his son, was my mother's quick, irritable reply. What book are you reading now, mum? It looks thick and big. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Well, that's funny. The block opposite ours is called Copperfield House. What are you reading now, mum? Nicholas Nickleby. Nickleby House is where my mate Tony Meehan lives. And next to that is Pickwick House. And next to that is Marley House. And opposite from that is Dorrit House. And over there is Oliver House. So if I read all of Charles Dickens' books, Mum, would I find the names of the houses in them? Yes, was a very quick and this time really impatient reply. I will not pretend I understood every word of what Mr. Dickens was saying in his work but I know a good well-written story when I hear one. I trust my instincts. I had faith in them. I do not believe it matters that you do not understand every aspect of a story. As long as it is written with passion, strength and care, you can and you will see it through. There are no barriers. Theatre, however, was the medium that finally got its hooks into me when I was 11 years old. Because at the time I was lagging behind at school. So my family paid for me to have a Saturday tutor. He was also a writer and a director for a black theatre company called Staunch Poets and Players. Most of their productions had something to do with what it meant to be black in 80s Britain, and they were never short of material. The work I saw using dance, drama, poetry and music to reflect the inner lives of black people at the time was exciting, passionate, vital, complex and alive. It was a thrill as well as an inspiration for me to see an entire company of confident black men and women owning themselves. I learned more from that company about what it means to be young and black than I ever did in my years at school. 
the truth as they saw it, as black people. Not every person's black truth, just theirs. From that, I've learned that there's nothing wrong with being labeled as a black writer. I've never found that phrase to be limiting. In fact, to be a black writer is one of the most liberating things a person can be. The only thing that can make a black writer feel limited is if others try to enforce their own definition of what it means to be black upon the writer. I suspect they do that because perhaps they do not fully understand the world that has been presented to them, that they are too embarrassed to say so because they believe, and let's be frank about this, as white producers, white directors, white critics, white journalists, they should know more about everything than everyone else, including the writer who happens to be black. The only problem with that is that they do not know more. So they sometimes rely on what they believe is a more obvious form of storytelling, which is either the usual narrative, such as criminality, slavery, immigration, or the revival, yet another black American place set ideally in the past, say the 40s or 50s. Black storytelling can be about anything. And within that, it can be as enriching and as complex, beautiful, ugly as anything else. Those stories are being written, but they are not trusted. Why is that? One of the most fundamental points of, I beg pardon, one of the most fundamental points of any story is to learn. To know something today that you had no idea about yesterday. Whenever I go to the theatre or see a film or any kind of art, actually, I always ask myself three important questions. Am I moved? Do I learn? Does it surprise me? I'd like to finish off by reading a short piece written by the amazing poet Langston Hughes. The night is beautiful, so the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, so the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. Um, and I really do appreciate it that you um, are talking from your lived experience very much and showing us how much that has integrated into your work and that um, those of others too that you've observed and their, their lived experience and how you're merging that into these imperative narratives today. And then we are all gaining knowledge from that, as you say, what do we learn from all these stories? So thank you very much indeed. And um, I will now ask Gillian Youngs, Professor Gillian Youngs to join me um, for our final input from our visiting scholars. So Gillian, hello. Um, hello. And I, I know um, you for a while, Gillian. It's very great to have you joining us. Um, and I know you're a, a very interdisciplinary scholar and you've researched um, right across all the diverse aspects of actually particularly looking at the internet and technology's impact on society um, with, a, with a particular focus on globalization and how this has changed um, our scenario across the last 20, 30 years, yes. Yeah. So, so with your current focus on strategic work and, and on young, young leadership and on diversity inclusion, I'm gonna hand over to you to, to lead us through your thinking. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Shalane. Um, I'd like to start really by uh, thanking the University of, of Greenwich for this great uh, innovation of having a collection of visiting professors. I think it's a first for me. And to thank uh, Gillane for the provocation to talk about what has sustained and inspired us throughout our whole journey. And this slide for me uh, really sums up a little bit about what I'm going to go on to talk about. Uh, I'm passionate about innovation, collaboration and creative communication. And that's the golden thread that has kept me going uh, through all the uh, challenges of, of my professional path and all the work that I've done uh, with uh, wonderful colleagues and uh, people across the world and particularly the women that I have worked with. Next slide, please. Um, here are my 10 digital rules to live by. My path has been very much about digital transformation and empowerment, and particularly working with uh, people on the margins of, of digital and uh, women both in the UK 
and in Europe and further afield in Africa and Asia. Uh, and these, these really, in a way, sum up the work that I've learned from other people um, and that I share with my students and with uh, entrepreneurs that I work with in the startup environment. But I've, I, I've deliberately called them digital rules to live by because I think they tell us a lot about how we should live as well. Innovation is about you, your ideas, your communities, your pathways to change. Don't be dominated by the tech. Make it work for you and your ambitions. If you don't know, someone else will. Find them, ask them, and engage their help. There is never just one path to success. There are many more than you can imagine. When you get stuck, just think again and look for another route through. Dream big, work small. Baby steps lead to giant strides. Stay inspired and work creatively with others to reach your goal. Celebrate yourself and every success, no matter how small. Realize that learning from every failure is a step towards future success. Be authentic and make sharing your story part of your brand. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share a bit about my tech path because I've come right through from analog uh, to all the latest stages of digital technology. I started working as a journalist on an old fashioned typewriter. I launched my business before we had things called entrepreneurs in my twenties, thanks to a laptop, um, uh, which then was a desktop really. You were more fixed at that stage, but at least it freed you in terms of actually being able to be digital, look professional and run your own enterprise, which is what I did in my small way. And then I've come through, of course, right through to the laptop world on the mobile phone where we're really mobile and the World Wide Web, which has actually allowed us to be present uh, both as businesses and individuals and social networkers. And the, the important thing about that journey is that as a digital innovator, it's developed me in a socio-technical way. So in all my teaching, in all my research and my applied work, I am looking at the relationship between people and technology. Um, I am interested in tech, very interested in it. I'm not a technologist myself. Um, I'm interested in what te technology can do for people and how it can uh, allow them to be empowered, enabled, to dream big, to aim for things, to work together to make those happen. Um, so in my, in my life as a, a, a technologically oriented people, I worked in my communications consultancy in the civil aviation uh, sector and in the airport sector and in aircraft simulation. I've worked on media projects. And then in the last 20 odd years, I've been in the higher education sector. And that's where my passion has been really located. And in more recent years in the startup sector. So working in with creative and tech startups in social enterprise, uh, most recently with young uh, leaders in Rwanda, uh, as much as in the business and straightforward tech startup sector. All my work has been about building communities, both locally and globally, whether it's my academic work, my activist work, particularly with women and other social entrepreneurs, and also in developing academic fields. Jelay mentioned um, globalization, and um, I'm one of the shapers of feminist international relations and international political economy as well. And I was one of the early scholars in digital economy, and I believe the first woman professor of digital economy in the UK. Without those communities, without that collaboration, I would absolutely not be here today. Everything has been about people who've supported me and inspired me and been there with me through all those journeys. Next slide, please. So a lot of my work has really been about the transformation into the information age and the way that diverse digital technologies have made that happen. So I'm absolutely committed to lifelong learning. I think it is the path for all of us to feel that we can renew ourselves, to feel that we can begin again if we need to. Um, but I'm very much focused on accessible knowledge and people. I'm interested 
in how the information economy has made us a network world in very diverse ways. So I'm still as passionate about old fashioned books and as ever I was. I love to be at my desk. I love to be in a library. But I've also become someone who really understands what it means to be present on the web, to be active on the web, to make things happen, to make change happen through networking. Um, through networking of all kinds, including social networking, through being there for one another and working on projects and making things happen. And most recently to what we might call networked innovation, um, to actually see how innovation can happen through networks that can extend across the world. So I'm interested really in accelerated, expanded empowerment through digital transformation and network power. And I'm particularly engaged with the way that the information society is about understanding power and information differently. To understand that via the web that we can access primary over secondary sources of information. So we can go straight to the heart of information for ourselves, whether we're an individual citizen, a researcher, a student, an entrepreneur, an activist, it doesn't matter. The web makes primary sources much more accessible to us than secondary sources. Of course, secondary sources remain important, especially for us in the academic world, but, but it's really changed things that primary sources are available much more easily. Horizontal networks cutting across vertical power structures has been fundamental to the work that I have done, particularly with women across the world. Uh, women had to work through vertical power structures previously, and now they can work much more through horizontal networks. Next slide, please. So looking to the future, I'm very focused on 21st century skills and universities finding their place much more strongly within the information society. And you see here that really we're talking about a range of foundational literacies, but also about competences and character qualities. It's really about the people we are and how we can transform ourselves as well as what we can learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, some fascinating and a lot of great information there. And I think that what is clear is um, that we need to talk a bit further about this kind of impact that your kind of work has into policy, into strategies, into new models of innovation um, at this national and international le level, um, led by this digital transformations that we're in, but also how you're weaving that between academi academia and the external um, debate that's going on. So now um, I'm going to ask all of the presenters to rejoin me. Um, to come on, um, turn on their videos and um, uh, microphones. Um, and also, I'm going to ask all our participants, this great set of attendees we've got, to add a few questions into the question and answers box. Um, we do have a couple here, and I will come to these in a minute. Um, so any more questions, do add them in now. We have got 45 minutes to have a good discussion, which is great. Um, but first of all, I'd just like to actually um, put across to the four of you um, to actually talk a little bit about a couple of the things that I, ca I think came up, which are uh, kind of working through, not necessarily all of you, but across, across this discussion. So um, Roy and Gillian actually particularly mentioned um, talking, well, Gillian, you know, talking about your young leadership side and young people, and I'd like to bring that up more. And Roy, I know that we had a discussion and you mentioned the discussion about generational, generational difference and intergenerational debate. And I wanted to bring that onto the table because we know that in co-creating change, um, and um, Ola, I think you also are following this through, that we actually do need to have diverse voices. And I'd like to talk about diversity in intergenerational sides. So Gillian, maybe I could ask you to add a bit in there. I think Ola, kicked us off by mentioning um, disrupting patriarchy and a big issue of disrupting patriarchy and also digital transformation is recognizing the natural 
leadership position that young people have in the times we live in. Mm. Um, at benefiting from, of course, lots of things about education and their digital competences and their, the, the way that they're very comfortable in a digital environment. Um, but I think that we have a long, long way to go in putting young people at the front of everything and actually being there intergenerationally to support them and move them forward. And the deficits of the pandemic make this absolutely urgent now. So one of the things I'm interested in are, are as an innovation are intergenerational job models which would allow the expertise from those of us who've gone before to sit behind and support uh, young people to move into real jobs and to really move forward beyond entry level. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have enough experience to know that this is quite feasible, but it doesn't really fit in the world that we're in right now. But I think the university sector could do a lot uh, to actually push this possibility forward. Roy, would you like to come in? I was thinking also about the students, definitely. We have this weave here, very strong weave at universities to ensure that we're sharing um, our research back into our teaching and flowing that back out into external um, uh, energies too. So um, I know, um, Roy, did you want to add into that at all? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, it, it, if I may, I, I, I wouldn't mind just being a little bit more specific here, but you know, but I, I'm, I'm a great believer in um, um, the specific can be universal. So just, 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 just bear with, just in, just in terms of, you know, just hearing the question and, and what Gillian just said is, um, I mean, as a playwright, as I sort of get, you know, of a certain age, um, I still do, I still do what I can to kind of retain that kind of, um, belief that I think all writers should have, regardless of what, 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 what field or what medium it is, whether it's novel writing, playwriting, whatever, is to always have a fascination with people. And also potentially you write what matters to you or, you know, or to be more narrowed it down, you write, what, you write about things that break your heart, I would say. I try to maintain that, but I do have a sort of fascination myself with um the younger generation um when i say younger i don't necessarily mean young people just like people you, you know who, who are coming after me come after me and i always wonder you know what do they find fascinating who do, who fascinates them and more importantly you know um what pisses them off what breaks their heart what do they write about in gen in general sense and i've been thinking about that a lot because this is where the specificity comes in is as I said, I'm of a certain age, and um, my parents, particularly my mother, um, were of the Windrush generation. You know that that first wave of Caribbeans who came late forties, and you know, and you know, to 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 start new lives at the at the invitation of this country, and um, and that was all over seventy years ago. They're not. They're gone now. They're more or less gone. And then I and then I look up on myself, and I just remember. You know, growing up, I mean, I said that in, 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 in my talk, kind of growing up, you know, you know defining yourself and how, you're looking for influence on what makes you black and British. And you ask that constant question, okay, what does being black and British being, is, is about, really? And um, now that Windrush got generated gone, I find myself, okay, we're the old guard now. We're the old farts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who are we and how British are we and what do we give to the people coming after us and more important how do they see us and i've just and i just i think that's a really really interesting and exciting playground of new stories and new forms of storytelling there is in terms of that yeah they you know whether they like it or not they're taking it to the next level and th their next level is what it means to be you know not just black but also just to be british and you know and and and, and, and where they take that from it so I, you know, I find that sort of um, fascinating, I, you know, stuff I want to write about myself, but it's also I'm keen to know what, you know, what fellow writers below me are going to do as well. So, that, sorry, I kind of went off a tangent there, but I hope it makes sense. <laughs> no, that's great. And okay. um, Ola, if you, yes, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, 
I suppose to, to sort of speak into a little bit of what I was talking about in, in my address as well is this sense of, um, I think it's about um, mindset. And if the possibility exists to, to reset that mindset. So what, in terms of intergenerational work, the thing that interests me and uh, which I'd certainly like to dig into more is, uh, is, is if you're creating a mindset whereby we are all custodians of, of the planet. We, we're only here, we're only here for a limited amount of time, 112 years from now, none of us will be here. Um, just as 112 years ago, none of us were here. And it's just whether you can move to that position where, where, where you have an understanding, as I say, that whatever you have, you look after it as best as you possibly can because you're preserving it, sustaining it, because you're handing it on to the next generation. And that I think we, we live in a, a world where we love conflicts, we love to rub up and bump up against each other and we'll divide wherever we can, whenever we can. So age is something we love to divide upon often, often there is, as Roy said, we're the old farts and it's that sense of you need to get out of the way, you know, we're coming through. And that's great, but it would be, I'm interested in saying, but you can be whatever you're coming through to, we've looked after it for you and it's worth it or where it's not worth it, then that's where you've got the work to do. That's where we fail. There's work to do in this particular area. But there was this other work that we have definitely, you know, I'm conscious of, it's really difficult. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's a prerogative of youth that you know <laughs> you are right because you're young. And anyone older than you has no idea. For instance, that, you know, what do they know? They don't know what it's like to be 20 now. I don't, it's true. I don't know what it's like to be 20 now. Um, but I have been 20 and I get that impatience and I get that drive and I get all that energy that you have. And that's fantastic. But it's just whether you can move that mindset that things are, there are some things of value and that there are things, things that have gone before you which, which are worth preserving, which are worth building upon, which are worth, that can be handed over to you, willingly and lovingly handed over to you as well. And, and so that we, so rather than always going back to square one, which is often what it feels like, which is why I spoke about evolution and not revolution, it's, it's genuinely going, what have we got here that we can build on? We don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time because we can work collaboratively. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think there, what that really links into is um, the whole discussion about inclusion and diversity, but that actually age diversity is imperative within innovation and new debates. Yeah, that how we're we going to move forward, we need a range of voices from a range of age groups too. And I mean that in the best way in terms of our university mix, we can enable that, but we can see out there in the world, but there are many decisions being taken by seniors on their own, yeah, without involving young people. And these decisions are big effect onto the next generation. So Heather, you are also hugely concerned by the younger generations in your work. I, I'm going to open, you've got your mic open so please do tell us because you're dealing with young people in very different situation than the students at Greenwich or the students in Britain are in. I am I've been dealing with uh, young workers in factories finding out what their aspirations their hopes their struggles are for the last 20 years and I also have children who are ages 29 to 36 and um, basically the view is we as the older generation, we have messed things up so thoroughly in so many different areas on the planet. We've allowed capitalism to become predatory and the futures that these kids are looking toward often feel quite bleak to them. I mean, I'm very concerned about the mental health crisis that is raging in New York right now and affecting so many of my friends, including my own family of, among young people who feel despondent and not hopeful about the future. I feel that as the older generation, we need to get out of the way, leave our jobs as soon as we possibly can. And it's unfortunate that we have a broken economic system that doesn't support seniors as well after 65 as 
it should, both in the UK and in the US, we have very serious problems around social security and pensions. Again, private sector has depleted so many of the resources and the savings of people who are now senior citizens that they feel forced to work. I'm working on a project right now, basically called the girls are not our right, which is um, doing an analysis of what's happening with single women who are not married, who are over 60, because there's uh, a, a lot of struggle out there uh, because of the challenges of the economic system. And it's really affecting the younger generation. In the Eastern Bloc and in China, people used to be forced to retire at 50 and they loved it. I mean, can you imagine? Um, you know, we're so far from that right now, but yet I hear from my kids that, you know, the best thing we can do having messed things up and put the planet on the, you know, the brink of uh, climate catastrophe is just to get out of the way and stop right. talking yeah. because they want to bring their new ideas into it. They, they have a completely different paradigm that they would like to be able to pursue. And they're not impressed by what comes out of these global meetings such as COP26 that again is dominated by white males over the age of 50 and it's not bringing solutions. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, yeah. Oh, please, please do come back in. Yes. Yeah. I, I was just going to uh, just that idea of getting out of the way. I think I think it's I, I understand that desire and I understand the energy for that. But I think that's part of the problem. I think it's, if you're going to dismantle this, if you're going to change it, if we're going to move towards that place we have to do it together we have to work together you know that it's it, it, it's it's folly to say um the, the the older generation completely messed it up and and they just need to go go and you know there is that expression baby in the bathwater so it's not that i'm an apologist for people of my age by any means but i know that people all the people my i'm not a white man you know in in his 50s who goes to the cop 26 do you know what i mean and and we've been we've been doing it for a long time anyways it's just that thing of to if you're going to increase your chances of success you just need to work together there, 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 are, there, there are so many voices potential voices in the room and we need them all we need all those voices um we, we and we need to listen to them as well you know and respect them if if, if that uh change is to be made okay if we're going to move to to that place where we can retire at 50 um then you're going to need the 60 year olds to get on board with well what is that paradigm as well because when this when the 20 year olds are saying the paradigm looks like this then we might go that's great but i can see the inherent flaw in that what about if it was more like this what if it was this so, so i just i just you know that's you know i caution <laughs> the, the revolution wiping it all away because then you'll be starting again and we might, you know, youth might. is rarely cautious <laughs> youth is never cautious and it and, and it and it needn't be but it's one you know it's one planet one society one so we're all in it together no and i think now one of the other things i wanted to put to all for you for you was um this um this concept of participation which actually comes you know close on to what we're talking about and therefore how do we enable a more meaningful participation, you know, across many people and many voices. Um, and there's a couple of, there's some great questions here in the um, question and answers box. And um, uh, the one of the ones I'm gonna pick out, Natasha Oxley, um, who says, it's great to hear about the positivity, uh, to hear the positivity about the future and demand for change from all the speakers. And then she says, Ola, you mentioned encouraging new writers to imagine the future and tell stories that will not that will enact it into being. Do you think this is something that is starting to happen and that there is a readiness for this or does it feel like there will be or is a need to rally writers and persuade them to do this? So this I'm linking this to this more participation side and how we get the voices out there. Um, I think it is starting to happen and but I um you know, at this moment, I struggle to come up with any examples to support my my assertion. Um, I, I remember, I, I mean, I, I think it's, hap well, you know, there is a notion of black joy, for instance. And I, I read a book in, in the summer, which was a whole series of um, short stories under the title of Black Joy and Black Love um, that, 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 that operated on the traditional narrative 
uh, you know, this structure, but was but was absolutely adamant that every single one of those were however many stories, 15 stories or so, they were it was going to be a positive story. It was going to be an empowering story. It was going to be, it was going to make you feel happy and make you feel joyful. So yes, there was there was still struggle. There may have well have been single protagonists, but the outcome uh, was always positive. And I and I and I and I say I sort of saw that as being part of, of a new move, a new way of thinking. And the second part of the question, absolutely we need to, we, you know, that's why I'm saying I want to try and develop a, a, a pedagogy and, and, and a series effectively of workshops which can really interrogate this idea. And, and I mean, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how you, can you sustain a whole series of, of, of narratives, of stories, of plays, um, that run counter to what we currently um, um, are, are doing and what we're currently producing, what we're currently broadcasting. What we're currently broadcasting, as I was saying, sending my address, it's reinforcing the page. You know, one of my favourite plays, A Raisin in the Sun, it's a fantastic play. However, um, I'm conscious that at the end of that play, um, the racists are still racist. You know, and that the the protagonist is moving next door to a racist family, um, and that's what you're left with. You know, and I'm not obviously that's not the message of the play, but it's not addressing. It doesn't actually take on that the the, the structures that, that that make the racist racist in the film. And I, and I say that's so that's the challenge. I don't know how we do it yet, but. Um, but I think people are starting to, to, to think that through a lot more. And obviously the whole issue around trauma and, and black trauma or any form of trauma yeah. as being, is that what we feed off? Are those the stories we want? Or do we need to, we've got to move on? Well, actually, Natasha comes in with a second question, actually, to Roy, um, but or to everyone, really, but just carrying on the line of writing and, and voices coming through. Um, she says, Roy, you mentioned that fresh and varied stories are being written by Black playwrights, but the stories are not trusted. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that we need to focus on making people listen rather than the idea of giving people a voice? which she says, which of course they already have question mark, of course. And for both Roy and Ola, have you started to see more non-naturalistic formats coming through in new writing recently? Um, I'll answer the last question first. Yes, I have. I've seen a lot of that um, and that's good. That's exciting. It's, um, but you know, for me, it's, it's re regardless whether it's non-naturalistic or naturalistic, just tell me a good story and you two, and, and, and you the writer you choose the form it's yeah you know, I don't think one is more is one one form is better than the other it's uh -huh. you know it's how the story how you serve the story that's for me that's um, the most important um absolutely yes people do need to listen and um it's yeah they do have voices those writers already and, and when I say those right those are the ones I'm talking about who's still struggling who, who still harbor a dream about having their plays done and maybe they're finding avenues close to them and not they're not then yeah, they're not getting they're not getting through the door, as it were. And um, yeah, so they're already there. They have their voices. So yes, the powers that be do need to listen. And also, I'll take it one stage further. It's not just about listening. And they need to they the powers that be need to understand within themselves. If you don't get it, if you don't understand it, fine, that's okay. You know what? Step aside and make room for somebody who will understand it. It's yeah, you know, it's it's about it's a, so it's, it's about listening. It's also about when and when. The, when when you can you see power you give it up and you just make okay I don't get this but you know what I think I've got an audience here that might get it so I will I I I will I will give the floor to somebody who you know who, who, who can reach out to them I think that's that 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 is key it's just you know if you don't get it move out of the way well Harry Derbyshire um also kind of follows up this line um saying he appreciates what's been said about not being limited um, in the stories we're able to tell and that the call for new stories written in a new way to help us work out new futures he's saying is important too and that he's asking really the panel feel there's pressure is exerted on young people to to keep telling old stories and doing familiar things in familiar ways and if what if so can you suggest any good strategies to resist that and i'm going to open this up to um Gillian and, and Heather too, 
um, who are actually both storytellers as well in their own way, yeah, with their different methods. Like you just said, Roy, you know, um, Heather using documentary film telling and um, Gillian using uh, young leadership and mentoring work, yeah. So, um, so please do um, come in any of you on these, these, these um, story questions. New stories. Um, yeah, I'd, I, I wanted to sort of connect some of what Roy and Ola were saying about this interdisciplinary setting we've got with this group of professors and this webinar and conversation. Because I think what they're signaling, and I use this a lot in my own work, is that creative strategies are very productive for actually innovating in mixing new voices. Um, uh, and I was talking about workshopping for existence. And if you think about the academy, and I think about other settings I'm often in, um, like policy related settings or settings where um, we're working with entrepreneurs in different environments. Sometimes now they are focused on diversity. So there is a mix of voices. But if, we, if we're honest, even in the academy, we don't introduce a lot of creative strategies to actually have a lot of different voices interacting in one space or at one time. There tend to be sort of linear tracks of single voices often. Um, and I think that's how you learn to listen differently. That's what's happened for me in my knowledge exchange work of working with social entrepreneurs, with other entrepreneurs in a very collaborative setting where people have different skills. I've learned to do what I call strategic listening, which is, listening it's hard as an academic because you learn to talk rather than listen so which is good too but listening and then at the right point when your knowledge your understanding will be really useful to help synthesize what's going on to interject and just share your thoughts and then see the wider group take it up um and uh, real things have happened in the real world with me doing that little bit of strategic listening and contributing. Um, so I think the experimentation and, and the co-creating co mode of creative sector could be brought in much more in actively to help practically uh, make environments have more diverse inputs and outcomes, you know, as Roy and Ola were, were pointing towards. So that, that's very helpful. And actually, I'm just going to segue this into a question from Olga Martin Ortego, actually to Heather, but which again, um, I'm, it connects into this discussion, but about choosing different medias to connect people. So Roy, you touched on it, yeah, and networking, Gillian, you brought out as a very clear point um, that networking is very much part of um, this innovative work, but choosing different medias to connect people and raising awareness, um, Heather, where, and you're using that to actually, you know, put the story forward, really, documentary, fiction, but mix, around complex investigative reports. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you find your narratives and the voices in it. I worked on complex investigative reports for many years when I was running Verite uh, because we would inspect factories and then write a report that was anywhere from 20 to 100 pages about what we found. Uh, a lot of times people uh, at companies would say these reports are too long. We just want one page with, uh, you know, a red light or a green light, whether we should work in those firms or not. And so I was always um, getting downward pressure to not write such long, lengthy, in detailed reports. And I think that that's reflective of what we've been seeing happening, you know, at the larger cultural wide level over the last decade, which is people want to read shorter books often. Um, they want to be on social media. 220 characters is fine. I mean, it's really difficult to get people to to read a long book, to uh, read a long report, even in business when it's um, you know in their area. So I decided that I was going to have to start communicating visually um, with my audience back in uh, 2013, which is when I began filming Complicit in China. 
uh, my colleague and I had come upon a scandal um, of young people getting poisoned in factories making smartphones. And I had a book deal. That was the first chapter that I was actually researching for the book, but I decided that we were just going to have to go immediately to film and get the word out there uh, to a global audience. We were able to get 1.3 million views of our initial trailer for the film and over 300 news articles uh, written about our findings. That would never have happened if I just stuck to working on the book and slowly after a few years of getting it published, we would not have been able to galvanize a, a global movement and we wouldn't have been able to persuade Apple um, to ban benzene and hexane, which are the two chemicals uh, that we focus on in complicit. But we really need community to be able to make these kinds of changes. And I think that it's great that there are larger voices that are starting to be expressed in places like Hollywood, in film in general, even in the documentary film world. I have just been shocked, and I've only been working in it for about nine years, by how uh, enriched it is in terms of directors coming from private wealth and um, having the money to fund their films initially until they're almost completed and get picked up by a distributor that closes the doors to so many people who do not come from backgrounds where they're able to invest speculatively in a film project. Uh, for me to raise the money to get complicit made took four years and that was a daily struggle. I received so many rejections along the way as a first time filmmaker. But we're also seeing, you know, that there are big debates happening, you know, Oscars so white, for example, in Hollywood, I think, as a result, a few more doors are opening, but it's very difficult to get films made. It's, I think, a little easier uh, for journalists um, to be able to take their reporting to magazines, to television, to broadcast. Um, they don't have to come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to be able to get their story told if they have breaking news or a story of um, societal significance. Um, but you're able to move an audience much more quickly when you are telling stories visually, which is why I've decided to stay in film and keep working, um, making videos and short films because the emotion that you're able to generate in an audience by showing them as opposed to telling them. Um, it's a much qu quicker experience, unfortunately. I mean, there's nothing I love more than diving into a 300 page novel and just, you know, feeling like I'm living that story and being sad when the end um, actually comes and then regretting that I finished it. But the reality in um, trying to persuade people in activism um, for me, has been going more and more toward visual storytelling. And I think that um, I'm going to have to just stay in that medium um, going forward in order to feel as though I have the chance to reach as many people as possible. Sorry. Here we've been talking about scripts and about um, uh, plays and 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 films, documentary films, um, and uh, we know that that is for the next generations and already you know abundance of new media methods of telling stories. So I think from my point of view, and I've got to um, uh, teenage and um, early twenties. Um, not kids at all, young people in my life. And, um, and I can see their, their way and being of learning and hearing and adding to narratives in the social media world with the fast um, uh, stories that, you know, disappear after, you know, 24 hours or that actually are just moving through and sending narratives across masses of people are very important. And I think that we are well aware the, the virtual worlds out there and the metaverse to come are all going to be um, narrative and non-linear narrative actually in many times um, storytelling places where people will um, share their thoughts their feelings etc and hopefully in positive and um, you know going forward in equitable ways because we also know there's a lot of fake stories out there too so um, I'm going to just move on now um, to a couple of the other questions so a couple of other angles on our chat here um, I've got a question here 
um, from Pam, Ber Pam Bernard. And Pam's saying, thank you to all the speakers. Very interesting and inspiring. And she mentions that you all talk about the materiality of agency and the multiple creativities or co-authorings that are inherent in diverse material encounters. And we've just been saying about digital practices, networking, journeying, co-creatively, activism, public engagement. But she'd like to know a little bit about what you are envisioning and planning next, maybe specifically for University of Greenwich, although I know that some of you are still midway in your discussions about what's coming next the next um, couple of years. But she'd like to know about really from the, the angle of future making, i.e. co-creating the change agenda. So I wonder whether we could just hit on that a bit, not specific, you know, the, what's coming next? Where's he? interconnecting of new knowledges and new policies she's saying here new practices new research agendas and how do we start to deal with this transient uncertain and um the precarity of higher, higher education institutions today and i'd just like to add to that uh input from Anastasius Marigianis. So this is a kind of bit I'm going to come to you all on, really, that he says, fantastic, many thanks for the input. And I was wondering if you could share your thoughts about impact and what impact means and how do you see creating impact um, in, in relationship to empowering individuals? Now, Anastasius is um, uh, the head of School of Design at uh, the university, and we are, of course, within the university language, and maybe I'll come to Gillian first to talk about that, constantly using this word impact yeah so I'm linking that into Pam's question about what what's next what's coming through how do we actually co-create a change agenda that has an impact an impact into possibly the, ex the, the external wider world than academia but what is impact in your view G Gillian, uh, Gillian how do you see that in relationship to how we can make these weaves between academia and those who have got their voices beyond academia? I think for me it links to the point I was making about universities finding their place more confidently and more creatively and in more complex ways in the information society. I, I really think for our students and for stakeholders outside the university of all sorts of different kinds, it is about that. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves about the point that um, Ola raised at the beginning about elitism and how a lot of that may have been addressed within the academy. But I just think we have to be honest that a lot of the the systems we use and the approaches we have still uh, follow very, very historic tracks in the in the ways we do things. And I think that um, bringing people from outside in, doing new things with them, with students and with staff. And I think us as academics, this is the path that I've followed, seeing yourself in your research and your academic work as at the service of society in very practical ways. So my work is about working hard to, to, to make people understand how important creative capacities, techniques, approaches are, particularly design thinking in the tech world. And, and to actually realize that design thinking, which looks at values and process is really powerful for grounding tech much more in in what the kind of planet we want in the kind of society we want in the kind of relationships we want you know and 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 making tech accountable to, to social processes much more and um that's the work i do in the entrepreneurial environment sometimes with success sometimes not so much um but i think that um just having that sense of being a, at the service of of society and other stakeholders and being a partner, being a partner in journeys to making change. And Heather, you also, you, your, the impact of your work is definitely out there in civil society, yeah. And um, how, how have you been, how much have you been aware of that now? You, you've been talking about your process, this shift from dry reports to the actually creation of documentary films, but how much has it rippled back to you? What, what, what have you seen of the impact that you've had? How do you see it coming towards you? Or what, what is it that keeps you going? 
Well, working with community is really important so that you feel that your work is having ripple effects and that it's affecting people in ways that are positive in the way that you want. So for example, when my colleague and I discovered that young workers were being poisoned in factories making the smartphones for the world, I decided that our ask had to be very concrete, very specific, so that our audience would be able to respond and be able to mobilize a global movement um, to pressure companies to improve the working conditions and to ban benzene and then hexane. And so we were able to very concretely see the results of that when Apple announced that they were banning it. And then a lot of other brands became aware that these were also issues in their suppliers. So I worked with a couple of campaigns, for example, to deliver over 300,000 signatures that we'd been able to raise online from people who were concerned about the issues. We delivered those to Samsung uh, as a result of pressure from our campaign and also from local campaigns in South Korea where Samsung is headquartered. Uh, they announced an $80 million compensation fund for the victims of benzene and other toxic chemicals that have been harming their workers. Uh, by the way, Apple has never done that. Um, nobody has been uh, compensated yet, as far as my knowledge, uh, for getting poisoned in the factories that are making our smartphones that are coming from Apple, which has 100% of its production in China. Um, so if anyone wants to call Apple, put pressure on them, um, get in touch with me and I'll send you the phone numbers and the email addresses. But uh, working um, with movements, working with organizations, yeah. working with colleagues yeah. for impact uh, for me is um, absolutely necessary because it also sustains you um, as an activist and a person who is advocating for change because we can't do it alone. No. And um, so that actual that that feedback that you get coming as as it has effect, which I know can be quite intangible sometimes. And also its impact for me is very definitely a future ripple that happens from my work. So um, I'm going to put this to to Roy and, and to Ula, too, um, in your work, which has been very specifically into you know national theatre royal court but reaching very big groups of people um how do you have a sense of impact in your in, how does it come back to you what do you feel coming back to you from that maybe roy can i go to you first can i unmute you roy please sorry about that. Okay. um it's it's a hard one to answer kind of um because because the very nature of my job, writing plays, and and you have the people, the audience, in the in the theatre are sort of certain select amount of time, uh, and you hope they like it. You hope they you know they respond to kind of um, what you've written, and what yeah, and um, I mean when I go and see my plays, or actually when I go to the theatre as a whole, I find myself watching the audience more than I watch the play. <laughs> I yeah, I just yeah that 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 that, 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 that remains my sort of fascination with people and um so so I guess in, in somewhere in that impact does does matter to me and how any particular how any particular story is grabbing people I think um what's going on in the world at a time helps sometimes or or not or something that happened a long time ago and but 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 it's got resonances with what with kind of um, what's going on now, we, you know, what, what's happening now. And I think most writers, myself included, we, um, a lot of our work stems from that, it stems from, you know, what, 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 what's, you know, what is, as I said before, what's breaking my heart at the moment? What's, what, what's pissing me off? Um, yeah. But that's, yeah. that's, that's only half the job, I would say. Right. I would, I, I would, I would say, because, you know, it's, it's easy, it's easier to do that, because I think writing anything is, is never easy. Um, but it's got to be. It's, it's got to do more than that. I think it's got to. It's, it's got to potentially. And forgive me if, if, if this sounds you know, pompous of me. I think it's got to potentially for me as a storyteller, and for me as the people I, I tell stories to, it's got to kind of twist them out, twist and turn them a little bit. In, in essence, we've got to kind of um, follow the basic nature of a story. You know, from A to B to C, and ups and downs and twists and turns. That yeah, you know, I think that's that's the that's the cornerstone of any story, any story being told. 
I would say. So shifting perspectives yeah, and yeah. getting more questions out there Absolutely. on the table, exactly. even when they've left and gone home, they're talking about it still. There's more questions coming from exactly. what they've heard. And exactly. And Ola, what about for you? Um, just we've got a couple of minutes left, actually. So I'm going to come back to you all in a minute for three key words before I wrap. But Ola, Ola first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think um, for me, in terms of the nature of the work I've done and been doing, um, I guess I suppose I measure impact. I, I suppose um, I've always, again, got you know motivated by injustice and and driven by the people whose stories we don't usually hear or the people who don't usually get invited to tell their stories. And so I suppose I measure um, my impact. Also, data has been measured by the the number of people I feel who have got involved, who have engaged with the art form, with theatre, who um, who traditionally were underrepresented, traditionally didn't necessarily engage. Um, and then beyond that, as a result of that, you know, um, it, it's one of those things, it's almost impossible to say, but you know that there are people telling stories, there are people who are empowered today who otherwise wouldn't have been. And as a result of that, they have gone on to empower other people themselves. The ripple effects, as you said, Zane, um, is on is, is the impact that it has on the future. Yeah. And I guess it's moving on from here, you know, the desire is to is to change the landscape, is to to, to encourage us to see things differently. As, as I say, talk a lot about mindsets, but talk a lot about vision and talk about future. And I guess it's you know, in terms of theatrical terms, what is interesting is you could say, well, 1956, there was a huge impact in, in the birth of the uh, uh, um, uh, kitchen sink drama, um, which had huge uh, impact and ripples. Then maybe 20, 30 years later, we had In Your Face Theatre, a very specific type of theatre that was brutal and raw and honest and tended to, to, to focus on the dark side. So what I am interested in with the new narrative is, well, what can, can it, is it possible in the digital age? And maybe that's, that's where the connection needs to be made in terms of our storytelling and what we consider to be our theatre. Is, is there a new, and you know, certainly in the pandemic and the amount of theatre that moved online and we looked at hybrid, et cetera, but is, are we, I'd love it if we were on the cusp of a new age, a new form, a new label for something. The thing about kitchen sink and in I your face. Yeah, I believe we are. I really do. And I yeah. think I've got a lot of belief in um, the next generations coming through. And sorry to interrupt you there, but I'm going right. to move to the um, the final part of this session. Um, I'm going to do a little wrap up. But while I'm doing the wrap up, could I ask all four of you to um, just to think about three key words that have really stuck out from you, reached out to you from this, this, this evening's debate, um, which have reached you most in terms of the process and impact of practice as research, which is what you all are. You're, pra you're using your practice as research, you're using research-led practice. And this is very important for the university. So, so while I just give you a minute to do that, I'd like to thank Mwala for her question in the um, question and answer. I'm sorry I haven't got to it. And I think looking at COVID and how it's affected everybody's art and creative work, we need to come to that and do a couple of webinars on it. But also thank you this evening to um, the group, everybody from the academic and professional services staff who worked together to get this um, output there. Um, thank you to Marco Thomas, to Professor Anastasius Marigianis, uh, Professor Olga Martin Ortega, Dr. Nick Holden, Karen Ward, Susanna Lowell and Faka Raza, who have all been working together to get this to happen with our excellent um, visiting scholars. So just to tell you that we do have um, coming up next week, in fact, um, uh, the first of a of two park cafes, P-A-R-K-E. And these are practice as research knowledge exchange cafes that have been put together um, by a research group I'm in in the university called Co-Creating Liveness in Embodied Immersion. And we're doing this with Greenwich Research and Enterprise. And the first one's next week on Wednesday, the 9th at two o'clock. 
and actually Gillian will be joining me again, which is absolutely great because here we're going to talk more specifically um, about uh, the, what impact is and what practices research is. And we will also have with us Professor Pamela, Pamela Bernard, um, who's at University of Cambridge, who's actually been listening in tonight as well. Thank you for being here, Pam. Both of them with thoughts on the process of knowledge exchange itself. So, and that's followed on March the 2nd by a Park Cafe 2, which is more of a workshop and networking event. And that will be held in, um, Wool in Bathway, our, our, our theatre in Woolwich, part of University of Greenwich. And that's an exchange to enable partnerships to happen between people who are interested in this practice as research external facing work of the university. So I think that um, Karen is going to put up, yep, she has links to the Eventbrite for those two events as well. So as we've mentioned, the events team are recording the event and this will go up on the YouTube of Greenwich Research Scene, which has got lots of webinars on it actually now. Um, so anyone that was unable to attend that you're talking to about this event or that you knew wanted to come, please do point them towards Greenwich Research Scene YouTube site. So, so just to come back to this, brilliant, brilliant panelists. Thank you so much um, to Ola, to Heather, to Roy and Gillian. And I wonder if we can just wrap with um, three key words each. So I'm gonna go to Gillian first for your three key words from tonight. Bit of a twist, joy. Joy is the one I think is brilliant. And stories about connection. Stories, joy, stories and connection, but stories yep. about connection. About connection. That's lovely. Great. Thank you, Gillian. Roy. Oh, I'm going to put you off mute, please, Roy. Thank you, Pam. Um, it's three words, but it makes one sentence. I hate elitism. <laughs> Great. I can go with that one too, totally. Yep. And Ola. I am going to go for proactivism, uh, networking, and collaboration. Great. And Heather, last but not least. Oh, I think Ola and I are on the same wavelength because That's i came okay. up with yeah i came up with uh, inspiration uh, operationalizing a call to action and partnering for impact fantastic great well those are very helpful set of words i'm going to just put mine in which is the intergenerational which i've really enjoyed that part of this debate um the whole thing of meaningful participation which i know you're all very engaged in with your work at all times and looking outwards as well as your deep research side and i think we need to look more at this phrase civil society and what civil society means today uh, maybe that's not quite the right phrases which changes every six months how we should talk about you know everybody else out there and we can't be generic but really how do we um, empower civil society to actually move forward in the right way for the future so thank you very much to everybody and to our um, audience too who have been listening in and for all the people that put questions forward too and we do hope that we'll see you again soon um, and uh, we are, will yeah do visit us again soon. And we do also, just to say, University of Greenwich are planning as fast as possible once we get past this, this, this the end, hopefully, of a very difficult phrase to go back into being able to have a hybrid form of um, these uh, sessions, both having physical and um, webinars online happening together so that we still maintain inclusivity in the audience that can join us, yeah either coming to us physically or joining us from a distance like Heather did today. So thank you for being with us um, very much indeed. And we'll say goodbye to all our participants and put our cameras off and um, I'll see you in a minute.